and welcome to Octoparts Control Plus Listen podcast. I'm Nora, and this is my co-host, James. Today, we are joined by Dennis Reed of Edgewater Research, an official partner of Octopart. And he's here to talk about Edgewater Research, the recent ECIA executive conference that he attended, and trends in the electronic supply chain sector. Thanks so much for joining us, Dennis. Thank you guys for having me. So you've just come back from this conference. Do you want to talk um, you know, a bit about what, what you were hearing and what are the hottest trends? Sure. So, so maybe before for the listeners can just give a quick overview of kind of who we are and what we do at Edgewater um, and yes. then dig into the conference just to kind of level set uh, everybody. So at Edgewater, we're an independent research company. We're based in Cleveland, Ohio. I myself uh, live and work outside of Boston. Our client base really expands kind of two vertical markets, if you will, one being the financial community. So thinking of that from like your hedge funds, mutual funds, pension, private equity. Um, and then the other is kind of simply within the industry. So that could be EMS, distribution, suppliers, uh, really anybody kind of building and or consuming components. Um, our product is typically used in both cases where we like to consider ourselves kind of the pulse of the industry and really kind of the voice of the industry. So our customers on both sides are, are looking at us to provide them a, a real time update on what's happening in the market in terms of pricing lead times, kind of all those big picture dynamics. So, you know, with that being said, having the opportunity to attend the ECIA event, ECIA event this week is is really fantastic. It's it's an event that brings, you know, give it give or take, call it four to five hundred executives from the the supply chain into Chicago. Um, you know, it, it encompasses both the supplier, the distributor, the manufacturers reps, as well as maybe a couple of other kind of service providers like ourselves. But it, it's really centered in the industry and in kind of in the executive suite uh, within the industry. So um, honored to be there. Awesome to have the chance to spend two and a half days, you know, not only with colleagues, but more importantly, friends. Um, and, and, you know, I think when you look at the conference in and of itself, it, it each year takes a, a different tone or tune and, in you know, when you looked at, at the high level kind of presentations or speakers today or this year, I should say, you know, it, it really was focused, I would say, a little bit more internally, in my opinion, in terms of what you could do or your mindset as a leader and how you could shape some of your leadership qualities and then ultimately take that back to your teams or your organizations and really, you know, institute some type of change. But it wasn't the the highlight or the you know the main focus. I was I would say wasn't really as much just kind of general trends, tact you know, tactical. It was very much kind of big picture, changing of mindsets, leadership styles, improving your leadership styles. And you know, with events like that in two days, when you're when you're lucky enough to have the opportunities, it's. I think it's shame on you if you don't come out of there without learning something about yourself and some way to operate more efficiently. Mm. What does that um, new type of leadership look like in practice in this industry? Yeah, you know, there, there were a couple of speakers that, that you know, really jumped out to me and, and you know, talk maybe big picture about that. And, and then, you know, naturally, I think when you look at our industry or other industries where the workforce, or at least the leadership, tends to to skew. You know, on the older side, there's obviously a ton of topics and discussion around not only recruiting the next generation, but also training the next generation. You know, with the focus on Gen Z and the millennials. So there's a lot more tactical stuff on that side. But in terms of, you know, really what you know, from that internally focused leadership, there, you know, there were a few um, that, that stuck out, you know, probably most notably were, were the two closing speakers on Tuesday and on Monday. And each of them kind of had an in their own unique message. So starting with the Monday one, 
it, it was a, a really, really captivating speaker that based his entire presentation on his life story um, that really centers around the question of what do you want to do before you die? Which Good question. Yeah, you know, hey. it, it, it is, is a very, very direct and, and harsh way to obviously think about your own mortality and everything else. But and they went through their whole story, not to go too much into it. But, you know, it was really about how do you institute change in that sense of where you sit today? That's the youngest you're ever going to be going forward. Mm. And then how does that shape your mindset in terms of making a difference with others? Um, wow. So it, it was, you know, it, it was very, very powerful when this individual went through his story. And, and you know, for me personally, um, you know, even outside of the business world, it, it, I took away a lot of things that we do inside of our house with goal setting, long term planning, things like that, that, you know, in the core of this speak, you know, presentation, what do you do before you die? And we're not thinking about that within our house, per se. But, you know, we're setting goals professionally, we're setting goals for our family, we're setting all those goals in, in you know, within our house, I don't know if we necessarily have the best mechanism to kind of monitor and continue to evolve. So it really pokes some deep questions of, you know, I looked at it and said, boy, there's some of these things that I've implemented just out of life that I, you know, I think make hopefully be a better person in all aspects, whether it's a research analyst, whether it's a father, whether it's a husband, you know, all those things incorporate. But then it gets into like, you know, the meaning of them and then how do you play it forward? Um, and find a deeper meaning. So, so you know, that was a, a, a pretty, pretty compelling story that I would say looked much more internally. And then you balance that with the, the closing keynote um, on Tuesday. And, and this gentleman told his story, and he's an ex-NFL football player, was drafted out of college. And it was just the power of teamwork and leadership and leading within a team in making decisions within the team. So you had on, you know, the end of Monday that Monday that I took it as much more of an internal reflection of how do you better yourself? And then you, you extrapolate that to Tuesday, which is hopefully how do you take your better self and then use that to lead others. And, you know, again, the leading others and there were some various strategies. It's, you, you know, in the case they used a lot of naturally football analogies because as a NFL player. Um, but when you think about, you know, how you do that from a corporation standpoint, you know, uniting around common good, um, finding a greater purpose, you know, really connecting with people, pulling people along who either aren't having their best day, you know, maybe the, you know, some of the other cliches. So it was, again, very much focused on kind of leadership styles, which which was, you know, very enjoyable, both internally and, you know, as we think about how we work together at Edgewater. What about like, uh, obviously, it was a leadership seminar and you, you mentioned before differences between generations. What were some of the points I touched on, uh, I guess, the difference between, you know, the current workforce and shifting into that more millennial and Gen Z led workforce? Yeah, what, there was a. a Wonderful stat that was shown in, in, you know, to summarize it in my words, and I probably won't do the speaker justice uh, by any stretch. They, they had brought up a stat, a, a, a survey from college grads in early career Gen Z that said, you know, what do you want to be effectively when you grow up? And it was worded much more eloquently than that. And something like 35 percent said they wanted some type of job in STEM. You know, then the next was wow. like 20% in business and you went into healthcare. But when you got to the bottom of that, which was interesting, the bottom two were manufacturing and then distribution and logistics. And when you think of our industry within the electronics industry, it is some of the most advanced manufacturing on the planet. But there is this perception amongst that generation that it's dark, dangerous, dusty, right? You know, whatever the four D's are. So 
and, and you know, same with distribution and logistics. They're not thinking about how technology over the years has has you know, ne- you know has changed it, right? So a lot of the discussion was um, a little bit, even somewhat kind of marketing related, if you will, about changing the perception, getting involved, because at the core with this supplier base and distributors and the manufacturers reps, you know, these are manufacturing companies. These are these are STEM jobs, but they're manufacturers. So technically, per that stat, only two percent of this generation would have an interest in working in any of these types of companies, which is purely a lack of kind of understanding or marketing to the generation. So, you know, I thought that was a different mindset and, in, in, you know, kind of takeaway about thinking about how you position yourself, whether it's social media, whether it's, you know, embracing podcasts, whether it's YouTube, any of these different channels that, you know, the previous generations may not be accustomed to, you know, it was a perception change, one, in terms of recruiting and bringing them in. Um, once they're within the org, you know, I think it was a little bit of a different, um, it, it was a little bit of a different discussion. And, and there were some of the, you know, what I would say, some of the, the, the stereotypical kind of ins and outs and the requests of, you know, we want more freedom and more flexibility. And, you know, we want to be able to work wherever we want, where we want. And, you know, with the labor shortage that is currently undergoing in the U S in particular within manufacturing, um, include and, and high tech jobs. Yeah. I think there's a hard look of, you know, if you think of it like a pendulum, where the industry might have been here this generation is here like you're going to probably have to find some way in the middle to engage on kind of a different level whether that's again embracing technologies and you know i i would say we're not the best even at doing that at edgewater but you know there's various ways of communicating where in reaching out to somebody who might be out of the office a couple of days that might just be sitting there and looking at their im or their team's account waiting for someone to kind of reach out like you've got to kind of step through the screen or step through the phone line or whatever and kind of really work to bring them in. And then equally as important when you go to some of those internal and some of those team building, like how do you make them a part of the team too and and, and acknowledge that they're different and find strength in kind of everybody's differences to move forward. I've been following obviously the, um, the situation with U S manufacturing, uh, tech manufacturing, uh, and reading all those reports saying that we're going to hit this massive issue by 2035, um, where we're going to have all these factories built and all these facilities to actually do the manufacturing, but there's going to be a critical shortage of specialized employees who can actually do the labor required to manufacture these goods. Um, and I think that ties into what you're talking about as a generational thing to some extent. But I think one of the areas that people aren't thinking enough about is education. Um, and, and I think that there's a big possibility there or big you know, opportunity for, I guess, the government to step in and subsidize degrees in areas that would directly benefit those areas of manufacturing. Yeah, it's, you know, we didn't, there wasn't anything per se about that much, you know, that tactical of kind of a decision, whether it's government or trade schools or any, you know, so I could, I could kind of get on a personal opinion soapbox of it, but, you know, I mean, there's clearly, um, you know, there's clearly a demographic challenge within the U.S., as you alluded to, James. And I, you know, I th- we're not alone, fortunately, when you think of other major economies, including China. And, you know, some of the stats with China would actually prove that their their demographic um, makeup and challenges actually probably outpace ours. Uh, but, you know, as, as you get beyond just the demographics and the retiring and and you focus more on, on, you know, that skill gap, whether it's government intervention, whether it's, you know, there's probably a whole host of of kind of different ways you can go, but you know, there, there's clearly needs to be some focus on getting people to study the right things. And I think, you know, one of the Prince presentations, you know, really touched on that at a very, very high level and said, you know, it starts all local. Right. So get your employees 
involved in their local communities, kind of K through 12. So, you know, starting in kindergarten all the way through high school, get them involved, especially, you know, if you're distribution or you're manufacturing, these ones where the percentage of people that want to go in, whether it's training, whether it's internships, mentoring, I think there's various ways outside of, you know, as you mentioned, just the education, the dollar, the cents, and, you know, big government programs or schemes, you know, there's other ways even more local that they kind of talked about of, of being kind of ambassadors or, or stewards of our industry and, you know, one, and then behind that industry, your company and being involved and in kind of telling our story and in, in what we do um, as an industry. I think you're right. This has to be a multi-pronged approach. It's no, no one group can carry the, uh, the burden of that. Yeah, absolutely. Altium 365 lets you hold the fastest design reviews ever. Share your designs from anywhere and with anyone with a single click. It's easy. Leave a comment tagging your teammate and they'll instantly receive an email with a link to the design. Anyone you invite can open the design using a web browser. Using the browser interface, you're able to comment, mark up, cross probe, inspect, and more. Comments are attached directly to the project, making them viewable within Altium Designer, as well as through the browser interface. Give it a try and get started with Altium 365 today. Um, so that was obviously the leadership seminar, but we also want to talk to you about some of the key trends that you've been seeing in the past, I, I don't know, six months, 12 months uh, in the sector. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, it was I, I was, you know, pretty fortunate as well to, to, to do a 45 minute session, literally batting lead off at 7 a.m. on Monday morning for those brave enough to uh, to start an hour early. And, you know, in, in it, we went very, very deep. And, you know, for the purpose of time, I won't go kind of that deep into some of the nitty gritty details and the things we're focused on. But, you know, at the high level, I think, you know, the overarching thing for the in industry right now is we've clearly moved from the COVID supply constrained shortage environment across components to an oversupply uh, scenario that really extends, I would say, to almost every end market in every kind of subcomponent or category with maybe the exception of like GPUs into data centers. So it's very, very specific where, you know, we're not talking about access. So, you know, it, with that being said, you know, I think our focus at Edgewater One, the focus of my talk at, at ECIA was was really level setting kind of how we got here one and, and two and more importantly when do we ultimately hopefully turn the corner and at least get back into balance and, and stop under shipping and return to growth and you know with those being said i mean to answer those two questions you know how do we get there fortunately or unfortunately it's a cyclical business so if you look at sales over a 20 30 40 50 year it's a pretty linear line up and to the right um, but capacity is always a step function. So when we're tight, uh, pricing goes up, lead times extend, et cetera, and suppliers react by bringing capacity on, and that capacity is a lag. And by the time that capacity arrives, even a minor disruption in demand, and you know, when you think of you know some of the unfortunate events in the world, you know, over the last two years, but even the last, you know, two to three weeks in particular, any of those can just pause demand enough where those capacity additions become out of sync pretty quickly. So, you know, that's kind of the past and, and you know, going forward, you know, I think the good news from a trend standpoint is, is it does feel like we've found somewhat of a quote unquote bottom through the summer months, which is, which is good. And it's been, for the semiconductor industry, it's been a relatively shallow controlled bottom, saying somewhere in the down 9, 10% off the peak sales on a monthly basis. So that's, you know, pretty shallow when you're looking at aggregate in an industry that's grown 30, 40, 50% since COVID started. So um, that's the good news uh, with how shallow it's been with, again, 
um, how orderly it's been. I think the the bad news to that side is the trade off that slope of the curve coming out um, is much more moderate because it's just going to take time for that inventory to ultimately work through the supply chain. So we think, you know, at a high level, you're probably looking for the industry probably a two Q at the earliest, more likely three Q. So probably early second half twenty four is when, you know, we've kind of digested and gotten into much more of a, a balanced state and we can kind of start shipping to consumption. Dennis, I I have a quick question. You talk about the seesaw of scarcity and excess. How often is it is it in a period of balance or is less often than the scarcity and the excess or is it hard to it, say you know it, it's if you look back over time most up and down cycles in aggregate last about four years in total so you know you run through your up cycle you correct down and in the split of up cycle versus down cycle if i had to ballpark it you about spend probably 60 to 70 percent of that time in an up cycle and then probably 30 to 40 in the down cycle so that's the cyclicality that comes through and in, in um you know to the core of your question how much are we ever in balance and the answer is probably never in all in all reality it, that's what i, I thought it, it, <laughs> yeah, it, for everything yeah it's it's the joy you know i've given some presentations in in the past where i have picked um yeah i've stood up on stage in front of a group and have said you know if your your kids or whoever and I have, you know, sales, there's nothing on the Y or X axis, but it's like the 08, 08 or 07, 08, 09 period. And it is a pretty abysmal sales chart over that three year window. And I'll, I'll get up there and say, you know, if your kids came to you and said, I want to go to college and take, have you paid 250 grand for a loan, you know, for my tuition to go to this industry and you looked and that was the results, you'd probably say not a chance. And then the next slide, I'll flip and, and show them 2020, 2021, 2022, which is just exponential up into the right. And of course, you'd write a check because the payout's there. You know, the harsh reality is that's the same industry. You can find kind of mm -hmm. any data point. And, and it is a concept that I've done some talks on and, and have spoken about you know, balancing for a customer, you know, for the companies in the industry and our customers in the industry is, you know, how are you thinking about your business, both from a cyclicality, meaning that shortage to excess, and then how do you balance those near term cycles with the structural growth opportunities, which are, are ever present and, and, you know, when you look at electrification in a very high level, you can go through countless examples. You can go to EV, you can go, you know, just, just think even of your home, whether it's a Sona system or Alexa's or whatever, right? You, you don't touch anything anywhere, work, life, your car that has not been electrified and that will continue. So that's that structural growth, but inside every one of those, there are periods of three down years and three up years. So it's kind of balancing that in, in trying to manage around that we work closely, you know, or try to work closely with our, our customers in the industry in particular with. Yeah, and that's, it kind of speaks to something that we talk about on the podcast a lot, which is flexibility in supply chain and it's uh kind of going back to what you were talking about at the beginning with this internal leadership it feels like when you're in the down period you have to be in the consciousness of you being in the up period or in the balanced and vice versa because you're all three at the same time uh, uh, that makes sense a hundred percent agree i i stood on i stood on the main stage in last year at ecia in 2022 in October and probably ruffled some feather by raising a hand and saying, I am willing to guarantee every one of you, your sales will be down next year. Mm. And the very next put up my hand said, but I also want to tell you why that doesn't matter. So let's again, to that point, let's think of that, you know, supply chain, whether it's flexibility with inside of the cyclicality, you know, how do you think about positioning yourself in, 
if you're early enough to it and you know when you think about from a, a company standpoint obviously you need to protect your financial health and your balance sheet and your p l and all of those things but what can you do to get ahead of it because the worst thing and there are countless examples of this through history the worst thing you could do is is get on the other side of it and be reactive to it and by the time you react, you probably should be positioning for the next up cycle. And, you know, there are companies that I, I could think of without naming names that, you know, in the financial crisis, unfortunately, laid off 26 percent of their employees um, in December of 08. And the cycle turned in February of 09 and they had to sell themselves a couple of years later because they just weren't. Mm -hmm they had cut too deep and reacted to that change. And yes, they showed flexibility, but it was a reactive, not a proactive. So, you know, that's kind of at the core, I think, when we work with our customer base in the industry, you know, that's been at the core entering into this year. And I would say we're having the same conversations of, of that entering into next year, going back to that inventory, it's probably going to last longer. The slope of the curve coming out is going to be moderate, more moderate. So plan your business conservatively and then chase sales as opposed to planning aggressively and not being able to achieve those sales and getting into that position where you're kind of upside down on the cost side in your financial equations and you have to react. Yeah. Yeah. Someone once told me something that I think of a lot, which is prepare to relax. That's so yeah. when you're, yeah, when you're prepared, you know, if some, if a storm hits, you can, you can relax. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Easier said than done. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, that brings us kind of to the end of time here, but uh, any last few insights you want to share before we wrap up, Dennis? No, you know, I, I would say the, the last one, you know, in terms of maybe wrapping up on the trend, I, I think the one other one in this kind of echoed in, in our the, in our presentation this week, but also a couple of the sessions that we didn't go into, you know, the, the emergence of AI is, is real. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, it is in a very, very heavy investment state right now. So at some point it's going to mature. And I would argue, and maybe for a different topic, there really needs to be some you know, some maturing around it, but right now it, it's significant investments. It's going to change how we ultimately all work. Mm. Um, but we're still very, very early in the curve. So, you know, that, that would be the one I would say last item we didn't really delve too much into, but was kind of a common underpinning through both our trends report or session as well as the conference. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time and, uh, for, you know, giving us all the information. It's a lot to process. Yeah, thank you, Dennis. Yeah, no, thank you guys really very much. It was it was awesome to be uh, to be here. Yeah, always good to have you on. We uh, always welcome you back for another update sometime down the line. Yeah. Absolutely, looking forward to it. Yeah, everyone listening at home, thank you so much, and uh, come back next time. We'll have another guest for you.